Welcome everyone to this One Dance UK Returning to Dance webinar. My name is Erin Sanchez and today we will be covering COVID-19 vulnerability and equality and diversity, a review of the government guidance. The webinar is about to begin. Please note that all attendees will be muted throughout the session. If you wish, you can add your name and dance context into the chat box to introduce yourself to other attendees. By the end of this webinar, we hope to give an overview of the pieces of UK government guidance relevant to vulnerable people. We also hope to discuss One Dance UK's role in advocating for and supporting equity and diversity in the dance sector. At the end of this webinar, we welcome questions. This will give us direction for what support we can help provide to the sector. Tomorrow, we will have a second webinar to discuss the implications of COVID with a panel of people from across the dance sector. These include Hannah Robertshaw, Sophie Tickle, Kimberly Harvey, Ellie Douglas Allen, and Jennifer Jean Charles. To follow up this initial information sharing, we will host spaces for discussion. This will allow us all to become more aware of each other's stories and situations and share how we are approaching these issues. Anyone interested in being a part of the open space discussions is welcomed. Just a reminder about the context of these webinars. Public health is a devolved issue, which means that guidance for dance activities in England, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales will vary. If you are planning dance activity, ensure that you consider local restrictions in place in your area or region. Also keep in mind Government guidance will evolve with science. No one, including us, has all the answers. And medical and scientific understanding of coronavirus is developing. Please also remember to read government guidance relevant to your planned work. Within these sessions, we'll provide a space to discuss, raise questions, identify issues, and share practice. We'll also support practical Im implementation of government guidance across the dance sector to help everyone return to dancing safely. If you haven't been to one of these webinars before, there are two ways to interact. You can interact with other attendees in the chat box. You can also add your questions to the Q&A box. We will try to address as many questions as possible live during the session. And these answered questions will be available in writing on One Dance UK's website after the session. You can also upvote questions you see in the Q&A box so that they'll move to the top of the list to be answered. Our panel today includes a range of different people, including our CEO at One Dance UK, Andrew Hurst, and our Deputy CEO and Finance Director, Christopher Rodriguez, our Head of Dance of the African Diaspora, Mercy Nabiri, our Dance and Education Manager, Tori Drew, Dr. Roger Woolman, a consultant in rheumatology and sport and exercise medicine, and Nick Allen, PhD, the Clinical Director of Birmingham Royal Ballet. A 
I'd like to hand over now to our chair, Andrew Hurst. So, uh, hi, I'm Andrew. Uh, a very warm welcome to everyone. It's good to see some familiar names in there amongst the participants, um, but also uh, lots of you who are new to us. One Dance UK is the sector support organisation for dance and also a membership organisation. We advocate the needs of danced politicians and policymakers, funders, education and other bodies on matters concerning children and young people, diversity, health and well-being for dancers and wider society and for, prof for professionals including freelancers. If you're not already a member, then please do join us. Together we're stronger. The UK government published guidance and a roadmap for reopening the, the performing arts in July that allows live indoor performances with a socially distanced audience from Saturday 15th of August. We're currently at stage four of a five stage roadmap which allows indoor performances with socially distanced audiences. The move to stage four was originally announced for 1st of August, but was delayed two weeks until last Saturday, but live performances indoors with a socially distanced audience are now allowed. This roadmap applies to England, but Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales are currently developing their own guidance and are likely to be similar, if perhaps a little later. This is something we've seen already through the easing of lockdown and we'll update members once the guidance for other nations has been published. Reopening requires a written risk assessment for anyone employing more than five employees to show that you've addressed COVID-19 using the guidance to inform your decisions and control measures and taking account of the needs of those with protected characteristics. We covered this in a previous session, which you can find on our website and YouTube channel. Today, we're considering vulnerability, equality, and diversity. And before we get to the government guidance, myself and some of my colleagues will give some brief updates on our work in this area. When we do get to the Q&A section, please note that if we don't answer your question, it may have already been answered. You can find answers to all questions, the video recordings and slides from all previous sessions on our website. Depending on where you are in the UK, the setting you're working in, and who you're working with, you'll need to refer to different pieces of guidance. Following an update to the guidance on 13th of August, professionals and non-professionals are covered by the DCMS Performing Arts Guidance for England. Dance studios in England can fully reopen and will need to refer to the grassroots, sports, gym and leisure facilities guidance. Those in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales will need to refer to guidance for the nations once it's been published. To date, only guidance for Northern Ireland on reopening venues has been published. Since the beginning of the pandemic crisis, we've been in regular contact with government and officials reporting on the impact on our sector and shortfalls in support. We made a written evidence submission to the DCMS Select Committee inquiry, which included specific details on the impact on the diversity of our sector and called for targeted intervention to safeguard the progress that has been made on diversity. The Select Committee picked up on several of the points we raised uh, in their report. 
We also wrote to DCMS and the Arts Council when the Cultural Recovery Fund was announced to voice our concern that diversity needs to be specifically addressed in recovery plans. We rely on our members to provide the detail we need to lobby government, so please do voice your concerns about diversity and inclusion in the dance sector with us directly and consider joining the webinar tomorrow, which includes a panel discussion followed by an open space opportunity for you to raise and discuss your concerns. I'm now going to hand over to my deputy, Chris. Hello. Hi all and, and again, a warm welcome to everyone joining. Listen, I'm just going to, I'm the De Deputy Chief Exec at One Dance UK, I should say. And as an extension, what Andrew said on the submission to DCMS on the impact of diversity to the sector. We held three rounds of talks with dance of African diaspora organizations and individuals to be guided on their key concerns for returning to work. We really believe that equality, diversity, and inclusion in leadership, workforce, education, and performance output is ethically right and more a pillar for an inventive and future-proof dance sector. It does mean that people of color, disability rights, LGBTQI, religions, age, gender, and more under the Equality Act are not lumped into one but separately, separately considered and planned for, it really just makes sense. Our concern, and I think widely accepted, is that diversity has made huge strides in the last decade, but is not where it should be at the time of lockdown and in danger of being reversed on reopening. I'll quickly go through the summary of findings of, based on those discussions. And I have to say at this point, for myself, I'm not fully satisfied that actions needed have been fully addressed in the different programs that have gone out for recovery. So it's important that we keep pushing and supporting this agenda and it'd be great to work together. So looking on this, it's, it's important that people of color, to, to know that people of color have been more proportionally affected by COVID-19. Community and participatory work in the dance sector are dealing with grief, loss, and mental health and well-being and needs. Need financial support to have skilled professionals and extend their work to hold communities together. As we're at stage four of reopening, we urge venues and marketeers to work even more strongly in partnership with diverse leaders to reach out to diverse audiences and your access for disabled people. With social distancing in venues, it becomes more important to include diverse audiences in marketing plans. Loss of diverse freelancers is a, is a key sorry, concern. Freelancers make up 70% of the workforce and remain most in peril. We recognize that organizations are making efforts to maintain freelancers and we ask that you make all efforts to keep and support diverse freelancers as their skills and knowledge are not easily replaced once they leave the sector, which they will have to do in just the need to survive. And to just wrap up, finally, if you're an employer, venue or company, please dare and really dare to look at your diverse staff's upward progression. It's about maintaining leadership. It's about changing the organization to something that is forward-looking, that deals with a modern UK and a modern world. And we ask as well, commission and stage diverse artists, and please do whatever within your means to hold on to freelancers. Now I'll hand over to Mercy. Thank you, Chris, and hello to you all. Um, for some time, uh, my name is Mercy Nabiria, Head of Dance of the African Diaspora. For some time now, 
we have been focusing on a phased mapping exercise for dance of the African diaspora, otherwise known as DAD. This exercise was our strategy that helped us to identify where the sector is, what it looks like now after two decades, and what the priority needs are. The methodology we used was MailChimp surveys, regional roundtable consultations with the sector, one-to-one -one sessions and interviews with key leaders in the sector, and we produce a report with findings and recommendations. Last year, we held a wild cafe with national and international delegates as part of our three-day international conference to, focus, to further explore the findings and the emerging themes in order to produce an action plan with outcomes and goals to help implement a framework for real change in DAD's future in the UK and beyond. We will provide a link to the report for details. However, I can share a couple of slides with infographics to show you an idea of the findings. You can also find these in our past issues of the magazines One and Hotfoot if you're registered as a member or if you are on our contact lists. Okay, that's the first slide and I'll share a second slide as well um, that shows a bit more detail. Right, so in summary, the survey findings include the sector has developed over the past five years, however, in varying degrees, for example, geographically. Um, for example, London remains the hotspot for DAD. The DAD sector is demographically diverse. The sector is strongly community focused. Funding and knowledge of fundraising are among the key priority needs for the sector. The sector, the self-employed and sole traders are predominant in the sector. Women make up the majority of practitioners. DAD is strongly rooted in connection to Africa. However, African contemporary practice dominates the sector in comparison to near traditional forms. We identified six key goals which we have included in our framework for a plan in the short term to medium term. The first is improvement in successful fundraising and sustainability. Our measure is that by 2021, 50% of the dance sector knows where to find opportunities and that there is a significant success rate in resourcing individuals and robust programs. The second goal is improvement for a DAD education and training infrastructure. Our measure on this is by December 2020, announce a revised biennial scheme that addresses at least three to five educational professional development sector needs identified through research. The third is more visibility and platforms for DAD work. Our measure is that by December 2021, at least three strategic partnerships are forged to collaborate with One Dance UK on providing platforms and promoting artists and their work. The fourth goal is urgency to document legacy, open up and increase archives. Our measure on that is that by December 2021, we would be able to signpost to or highlight at least two significant resources that focus on dance of the African diaspora. The fifth is more audience engagement and that Annual statistics from a national programming perspective indicates at least a 5% increase in some form of black dance engagement physically 
or digitally. And the sixth is providing support to build networks to share and reduce the knowledge gap across the sector. Our measure, by December 2021, we will have all support a scheme that enables intergenerational networking, sharing and peer-to-peer -peer learning and collating resource at least twice a year. In May, we sent out a call to action in our Hotfoot Spring edition for the sector to share initiatives that they are working on or know are happening in the sector and can benefit the greater good. We're still receiving good responses and are putting together a resource pack to share in the November issue of Hotfoot. In June, we launched a social media campaign called iMove to shine a spotlight and to highlight artists, art forms and initiatives across the sector. iMove and a new Facebook community were created. Also, we continue to invite people to identify and suggest areas in the action plan that they can be involved in. This is ongoing and from next month we will set up focus groups to work with us on each of the goals identified above. So please get in touch if you're interested. Most recently, we continue to attend several Zoom meetings organized by various people in the sector over the past month. And it goes without saying that the current affairs filled with analyzing the impact of COVID-19 and the Black Lives Matter movement has exposed and exacerbated the long-standing inequalities present in the structures and systems we work with daily. We're still looking for answers and how to appropriately respond to the evolving future and to what I see as a triple crisis that we are facing globally, that is around our health, our economic well-being, and race relations. We cannot do it alone. We're looking to government recommendations, but we're also seeking to hear, listen, and learn more from you to help us adjust and review our plans. Looking back historically, collective voices from the sector helped to set up ADAD, that's the Association of Dance of the African Diaspora, in 1994. And it was a direct response to what was needed to help address the imbalance in the dance ecology. It aimed to raise awareness, appreciation, and understanding of artists and the art forms of the dance of the African diaspora, which has contributed to the British culture offer for many years. This vision, is still yet to be realized to its full capacity. The British context poses unique challenges to the expressions, aesthetics, and themes emerging from dance artists within the diaspora. The gaps in the records and experiences of dad in Britain demonstrates the need for the work to continue. Dad is diverse in of itself, and it is by closely examining these complexities that its value to society can be wholly appreciated. So it's for the above reasons coupled with the compiled information sourced from the meetings and the conversations which we are having both at grassroots and high level office that we continue to advocate to, advocate to um, policymakers funders and partners in the wider creative sector, locally, nationally and internationally, to recognize the value of this diversity and to ensure that it is well equipped to deal with the obstacles faced year on year. Thank you. So we'd like, like now to pass over to Dr. Roger Woolman and Nick Allen PhD. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Roger Wolman. I'm a consultant in rheumatology and sports and exercise medicine and work with the dance community for at least uh, 20 years. Um, and uh, I'm also involved with uh, the rehabilitation of patients who have been uh, severely affected by COVID-19. So uh, what I want to do is just talk a little bit about this concept of COVID vulnerability. What has been very apparent since the onset of COVID at the beginning of this year is the range of illness that people can have. Some people having a totally asymptomatic disease at one end of the spectrum and the other end of the spectrum are patients who end up in the ITU with a significant portion of those uh, dying. And over the months, we've gradually got a better understanding of who is at greater risk um, and who isn't, although there's still a lot of unanswered questions with regard to this. Probably the single biggest factor is age. So that certainly under the age of uh, 40, the risks are minimal, but the risks start increasing from about the age of 60 onwards. Although with each decade from your teens onwards, the risk goes up very, very slightly. The risk becomes more significant after the age of 60. And that, so that's one factor, but there are several other factors. More, uh, the severe disease more likely in males compared to females, more likely in people with obesity and a range of other conditions. And one way of assessing your risk is by doing what's called the COVID age. And you can get this from the website by putting in certain aspects about your general health. And that can give you an age in relation to the age of 60, which is a sort of the cutoff point. So that even if you are 40, but you have lots of other risk factors such as diabetes or hypertension or other underlying health conditions, then your COVID age could be ranked well over 60, i.e. the risk of you having severe illness uh, would be that much greater, even though you may be only age 40. So I strongly recommend that you have a look at this COVID age concept to give you a sense of where you fit in to that risk spectrum. What I want to do now over the next <clears throat> few slides is just take you through some of those, uh, those risk factors. So if we can move to the next slide, yeah. So, so as we've mentioned, it says those people at greater risk are those over the age of uh, 70, although I would probably take that <clears throat> 10 years younger <clears throat> the people at higher risk and uh, other health conditions will obviously influence that as I've already pointed out. So next slide. So um, if you're under 70 then you look at some of the other risk factors and those would in a very simplistic term come into those who uh, are advised by their GP to have a flu jab. As we know flu is um, uh, very uh, it's a, a respiratory virus which pr produces similar although not identical symptoms to COVID and therefore anyone who is recommended to have a flu jab whatever their age is more likely to get a severe response if they get exposed to COVID. So uh, those with mild to moderate respiratory diseases such as asthma, uh, emphysema, bronchitis, these sort of illnesses are increase your risk of having a severe outcome when exposed to COVID. Next slide. Thank you. So uh, other um, conditions uh, which can increase your risk are chronic heart disease, uh, such as heart failure or previous heart attacks. Um, we know that COVID can affect the heart muscle and can affect the blood vessels going to the heart. Anyone with chronic kidney disease or chronic liver disease, uh, in addition, chronic neurological conditions such as Parkinson's, uh, multiple sclerosis, motor neuron disease, these are all risk factors. I've already mentioned obesity, um, although uh, the slide suggests uh, a body mass index of 40. Um, the normal range for body mass index is 20 to 25, and really anyone over a body mass index of 30 is going to have an increased risk um, uh, if they get exposed to COVID. Going along with high weight is uh, diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes, which also increases your 
risk of a severe response to COVID. Um, and then a hematological issues such as a weakened immune system um, can uh, do it. So if you've had an underlying uh, lymphoma or previous uh, blood cancers, that can increase your risk. Taking of steroid medication can increase your risk. And the other hematological factor, which is uh, very relevant, particularly to the BAME community, is having um, sickle cell disease, and that increases your risk with COVID. And finally, uh, pregnant uh, women, particularly pregnant women with other medical complications, are going to also be at a higher risk with COVID. Uh, and now I want to pass over to my colleague, uh, Nick, to take you further forward with this. Thanks, Roger. Uh, as you see with the guidelines, it also includes those who will be clinically extremely vulnerable. Uh, and those are the people that who uh, would have already sort of been notified, they would have been notified, uh, certainly in England, around whether or not they are at high risk. So expert doctors in, in England identified specific medical conditions like Roger was talking about, and then using those as part of those personal risk assessments. Now that extreme vulnerability, that group, obviously uh, we'll, we'll look at the inclusions of those who have had organ transplants, uh, and then there's some specifics around the cancers, people still undergoing active chemotherapy, uh, those undergoing radical radiotherapy, uh, and particularly those with blood or bone marrow, such as leukemia, lymphoma, uh, myeloma, or at any stage of their treatments. Obviously, people having immunotherapy uh, and the immune functions compromised are going to be those considered to be clinically extremely vulnerable as well. So the government came along with guidance on shielding and protecting those people, and those people would have received notification. Can you go to the next slide? So we, we've got the, the list of those who would have been considered extremely vulnerable. Uh, and as we said, it's those people who have had bone marrow stem cell transplant, certainly in the last six months, or who still take an immunosuppressant drugs. People with severe respiratory conditions, so that includes our cystic fibrosis patients, uh, those with severe asthma or severe COPD. Uh, and then it's the rare diseases, and, and Roger obviously alluded to that uh, when he was chatting earlier on, because of significant risk of infection, so that severe combined immunodeficiency or the homozygous sickle cell. Uh, people on immunosuppressants, you can think for obvious reasons because they increased risk of infection. And as Roger said, although pregnancy is not considered clinically extremely vulnerable, uh, those who are pregnant and have a heart disease for the reasons that we know uh, the impact around COVID and the heart, whether or not it be congenital or required, fall under the category of clinically extremely vulnerable. Uh, and thanks to lockdown, I know having discussions with some of, the, uh, converse, uh, some of the, my colleagues with other companies, is we have had a slight increase in the amount of pregnant dancers that we're dealing with at the moment. So it's something that we really do need to be mindful of. So any other person who's been classified as extremely vulnerable uh, would have been notified. There was some cracks in that, in that some people who possibly would have been considered uh, extremely clinically vulnerable maybe didn't receive shielding letters. And so if you're uncertain, have a chat with your GP or have a chat with whichever medical team that you were, uh, are working with. So if there's any questions, I would certainly look at having that conversation first. So just, just to sort of understand where your rights are, because obviously the position on clinically extremely vulnerable people has now changed so that where previously you were protected with uh, statutory sick pay, at the moment, because those regulations and those restrictions have been lifted, you can, as a clinically extremely vulnerable person, return back to work. And it's your employee's uh, position now to help you transition back into work. Uh, and in order to protect you in your workplace. And so from, from my perspective, that's something that we're working very closely with the uh, members of our company. So when we do our personal risk assessments, we look at that and we might still be making changes to their work environment to account for the fact that they were previously a shielded patient and then still fall under clinically extremely vulnerable. 
So those sort of things will take place. So as I said, because of the uh, changes now with community infection rates, the government has allowed those who are cl clinically extremely vulnerable to go back to the workplace, assuming that it's COVID secure. Uh, but if it's possible, and we, again, we've done this with our organization, if you can work from home, then we continue to do so. And we minimize the amount of time that if they do have to come back into the office for whatever reason, we minimize how much time they're actually uh, spending in the office environment and we are extremely vigilant with our COVID safe and COVID secure mitigations that we've put in place in the company. Obviously, if you need to uh, support to work from home in your workplace, have a look at the uh, way to apply for access to work. And it's there and it will provide support for disability related extra costs of working that might be beyond standard reasonable adjustments an employer uh, must provide. It's also noteworthy to uh, employees, they should be mindful of the particular needs of different groups of workers or individuals. Uh, and that doesn't just relate to COVID. Obviously, that is something that we need to be considering at all times. Uh, and it is obviously breaking the law to discriminate uh, directly or indirectly about anybody who has protected characteristics, uh, irrespective of what's going on with COVID at the moment. So employees have these particular responsibilities towards disabled workers and those who are newer expectant mothers. And I would hope that organizations that uh, have people who might be clinically extremely vulnerable are really paying attention to what extra mitigations we can as, as employees take in order to safeguard and support them because it's part of, of how this industry has become as great as it is. And then I'll pass over to Tori Drew. Hi everybody, um, I'm going to be talking from the point of children and young people, so next slide please. So dance is the most physical of all the art forms and is usually created and experienced in a group setting, especially within the inclusive dance practice. Today's young people are feeling lonelier, nearly a third are overweight or, or obese and are more likely to be depressed than 10 years ago. Therefore, the practical solution to this is to offer a physical activity like dance that acts like a natural medicine and possible prevention to both physical and mental health issues, as dance is known for reducing young people's anxiety levels and improving health and mental well-being. At One Dance UK, we advocate for Dance for All, believing that every child and young person should have the equal access and opportunity to dance in school, community settings and private schools, dance schools. Through advocating for inclusion within dance, we are hoping that there are more opportunities for everyone to dance, even during these times. Dance often built, includes physical contact with other people. This has made dance very challenging to deliver during lockdown and will continue to do so while implementing government physical and social distance guidances. Dance is a medium for young people to express themselves and reflect on their lives and situations. These values make dance an important channel to make sense of the changes they've experienced during the pandemic. We want to ensure that due to restrictions that might be in dance at the moment, that no one is excluded. Sport England are tracking physical activity in children and young people, and they found that only 18% of children and young people during lockdown were doing the recommended 60 minutes exercise a day. And this is still low at only 21%. Whilst 10% of children and young people are doing no exercise at all during lockdown, and this is still at very low, with 9% only 9% um, of children and young people doing no exercise. This data doesn't track those with disabilities, but it does for adults. Adults with disabilities are only 22% um, of these only doing 30 minutes per day, and 38% of adults with disabilities are stating they are doing no exercise during lockdown. In a small research group, they found black and other ethnically diverse community groups had an increased exercise, but this was only within the 30 minutes or less um, exercise group. Remember that the recommendation for children and young people is 60 minutes of exercise a day. It was interesting to see that black and other ethnically diverse community groups were more likely to exercise indoors. But this could be down to the barrier of feeling afraid to exercise outdoors due to the increased risk of infection. This is something that Sport England would like to look into. Next slide, please, Erin. 
In this Children and Young People section, we'll be covering the Department for Education full school guidance, the Supporting Children and Young People with SEND guidance, and the protective measures for out of school settings during coronavirus. Also, we'll be looking at the DCMS Providers of Grassroots Sport and Gym Leisure Facilities guidance. Please note that any activity with children and young people, that the guidance from Department for Education supersedes any others. Also, I'll be covering guidance particularly to vulnerable children and children with disabilities. For generic information on dance with children and young people, please see webinar five, where we went into detail about teaching dance in schools and out of school settings. I'll also be referencing um, an Activity and Alliances document, but please note this document is for general information and guidance purposes only. Next slide, please. The full school guidance. The full school guidance highlights that schools need to maintain a broad curriculum, especially to those with disabilities. Schools should still ensure the appropriate support is made for pupils with special educational needs and disabilities ensure any assistance that they may usually have pre-lockdown is not taken away. In Northern Ireland school guidance, it states that you need to ensure that pupils with complex needs or disabilities are not disadvantaged. England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland return to school guidance all state that students need to be kept in separate bubbles and maintain social distancing. But this of course depends on the children's ability to distance. Therefore, if you are going to schools to teach dance, um, you need to ensure that the students do have the same assistance as before, and also you need to consider their bubbles. The school guidance suggests where individual risk assessments are used for children and young people, that they should contact parents, involve them in planning for the child's return to school for their risk assessment. This could be a place you as a freelancer or dance teacher can ask schools that you can be invo involved in this planning. So you can help ensure that there's a good risk assessment for dance to ensure that these type of students can still dance. In terms of alternative provision, such as pupil referral units, due to the smaller size of these settings, um, they may have whole school bubbles as part of their systems. So please consider this in your planning. However, in all school settings, if it is not possible to maintain bubbles used during the school day, then your dance classes should be small and consistent groups. You should bear in mind the potential concerns of pupils who are anxious about returning to school and returning to dance. This may include pupils who have themselves been shielding previously, or those concerned about the comparatively increased risk from coronavirus, including those from Black, Asian and ethnic backgrounds. Think as a dance teacher or artist how you can build confidence of these students within your dance classes and that they can take this confidence to their daily living. Next slide, please. The SEND School Guidance. The SEND, the Special Education Needs and Disabilities School Guidance, recognises that some children and young people with special education needs present behaviours that are challenging to manage in the current context, such as splitting uncontrollably. It will be impossible to provide the care or dance movement that some children and young people need without close hands-on contact. In these cursed circumstances, you should minimise close contact, work, contact wherever possible, increase hand washing and other hygiene messages and risk mitigations. The, the school guidance has recently been updated to include the use of face coverings, stating that face coverings should not be used in schools due to the negative effect on communication and thus education itself. In Wales, the school guidance also highlights that masks can possibly impair learning, but face coverings are recommended where social distancing cannot be maintained. This may be the case if close contact is required. However, it is at the school's discretion whether you need to wear a mask when working with children and young people with these types of disabilities. The SEND school guidance states children with some underlying health conditions have been advised to take particular care to follow social distancing and hand washing and hygiene advice. The guidance states that clinical illness for children who might become affected with coronavirus is generally much milder and therefore children in clinically vulnerable groups should therefore continue to attend return to school. However, shielding advice may change and you must always keep up to date with the latest guidance on shielding. Next slide, please. Out of school context. So within the, within the, the out of school guidance, 
It states it is breaking the law to discriminate directly or indirectly against anyone in employment and the provision of services because of protected characteristics. This is what Nick said earlier, such as um, discrim discriminating against age, sex, race or disability. The outer school guidance recommend that children to be kept in small consistent groups of no more than 15 children and one or two staff members. However, you may feel that your students will need more staff support. The SEMD school guidance um, will help you with this because it says you need to ensure that there's enough support staff for your children and these are at south ratios. So you need to consider this when planning for your out of school classes with children with special needs. However, the out of school guidance is due to run out because it only covers the end of the summer holidays. So please check the government website. You can just put it into Google and check this daily for when it is updated. I'm sure one Dutch UK will put it on their social media too. So the out of school guidance also states that when parents pick up the children from your clubs, they must do this waiting outside. However, um, it does have other considerations when this is not possible. If you have vulnerable students, you may want these still collected from your dance space or dance studio. They do recommend maybe having a designated waiting area with clear designated social distance spots or even in a well ventilated room. There is emerging evidence that black and other ethnically diverse community individuals may be more severely affected than the general population by coronavirus. Providers should be especially sensitive to the needs and worries of these communities and you should consider if any additional risk mitigations to put in place to help put their minds at ease. The coronavirus outbreak may have caused significant mental health and well-being difficulties for some children and this puts them at more increased risk of harm or abuse. Therefore, it is important you are aware of safeguarding issues uh, and also the policies in place. If safeguarding issues come to light, they should be addressed using your settings protect child protection and safeguarding policy. If you have your own dance studio or dance company, and have more than one in, uh, one have one more than one employee then you need to make sure you have your own safeguarding policy in place and you, all your staff know what to do if they have a concern or a disclosure is made to them by a child in addition the out of school guidance recommends bernardo's recently launched see here response service which is a program created to help children young people in england who are experiencing harm and increased adversity during lockdown Next slide, please. The Grassroots Sports um, Gym Leisure Facilities Guidance. Um, I'm just going to start with Northern Ireland, say, actually, in their sports guidance. And um, they state it's important that everyone is able to access all these sporting opportunities, including those with disabilities, because this, for this group, sport is much more positive and more of an impact on these type of people in terms of health and well-being. So within the grassroots guidance, um, it does highlight the importance of making sure that the access to your class is just as important as the actual class itself. So make sure there's easy access, there's disabled parking, making sure there's good changing room spaces for those with disabilities. However, please note, do remember I did say, any activity of children, younger people, um, you should reference the Department of Education guides. Next slide, please. So look into the Activity Alliance for advice. They do a really nice guidance. Um, the Activity Alliance advise that it is important to communicate to those with disabilities new safety measures, such as cleaning procedures, routes in and out, out of your class, and changing facilities to your participants with disabilities. They advise that when sending your information to consider the images and language you are using and how positive and welcoming these are. Remember to provide alternative formats such as large print, audio, easy read, British Sign Language, videos with high quality voiceovers and captions, and also children young people consider using Makaton. Not everyone has access to the internet, so you might want to consider people who are not online and how they will access this information beforehand. Activity Alliance recommend avoid use, using labels such as vulnerable. Not all disabled people and children young people with health conditions relate to this um, term of vulnerability. Wearing face coverings or masks may impact clear communication. 
For example, people who lip read or have visual impairment. Be aware and ensure that you have other formats available to support communication. Consider solutions such as using accessible face masks, printed pre-printed information and pre-recorded films and a notepad to write down notes. For those working with children and young people with disabilities, if you are using floor markers, please consider the types you use. Consider the pitch, positioning, colour, contrast and size of your distant markers on the dance floor. Maybe use tactile tape. Consider boosting confidence through your welcome back sessions. Maybe don't dive straight into dance material. Um, you can have positive dance sessions, mindfulness, um, themes where they can express themselves to help them get, regain that confidence. Activity Alliance recommend the step tool as one of the ways to do your risk assessment. And I know myself, I use this in terms of my own risk assessment. Step stands for space, type of activity, equipment and people. And this will help you make an inclusive um, atmosphere for your dance class. At this time, you may want to seek guidance from national government bodies within the sports sector, just so then you can maybe cross-reference and help come up with ideas how to make it a safe, inclusive um, atmosphere for your participants. For example, the British Wheelchair Association, they have an excellent return to play guidance and they advise that every, after every session that you do with wheelchair users that they sanitise straight away their wheelchair because you need to consider what support equipment those people with disabilities may have and how they will be cleaned before and after. Um, also, I recommend cerebral palsy. They have um, It's Okay to Play guidance, and this is really good in terms of like looking at the different types of equipment, the benefits to these people, and yeah, it's really informative. Lastly, I recommend looking at the Sport England Club Matters guidance, which is called Recognising the Needs and Views of People at Your Club and Organisation during COVID-19. And it's really good because it kind of helps you understand how you can inform the parents and the children and people with disabilities themselves in terms of like their concerns, their worries, and how you can help them feel confident in terms of coming back for your activity and dance. And I'm now going to hand back to Evie. Well, thank you very much, Tori, and thank you everyone um, on the panel for your presentations. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and if the panel can all turn on their video, um, we're very happy now to take questions. So if anyone does have any questions, please do feel free to put them into the Q&A box. Um, if, however, you uh, would prefer to ask your questions tomorrow, there's also an opportunity to um, ask questions tomorrow in the open space. And we certainly encourage everyone who's been a part of these sessions today to um, uh, take part in that session tomorrow. It's from 10 a.m. to noon. And in the meantime, are there any questions that the panel has for each other? Oh, I see there's a question in the Q&A box. It's from Amanda. Andrew, do you want to just read that out? Yeah, um, Amanda is actually saying it's not a question, but um, she wanted to thank everybody for all of the information which she's finding very helpful. So it's very good to hear that, Amanda. Thank you. Um, I'd also just like to express my Thanks to everybody on the panel. I know there was a lot of information today, um, but just as a reminder, uh, all of these webinars are recorded um, and you can find the slides and the recordings on our website. So um, there may have been quite a lot to digest, but you can revisit it um, and you can always send questions afterwards. Uh, there's another question that's coming, Martin. So, Martin says, hi there, I like the idea of confidence boosting exercises before starting the dance classes. Uh, does the panel have any suggestions? So, um, Tori, I think this was uh, in your presentation. So, um, have you got any examples you'd like to share? 
Um, what I do recommend is looking into mindfulness and it's, um, there's different ways to do it. It's about you becoming aware of your own senses or putting yourself in a place. Um, we do have a lovely mindfulness uh, resource coming out in our one magazine actually. But what it talks about is imagine yourself as a bubble. So you're like, you're feeling yourself as a bubble, you're hearing it, you're smelling it, you're taking yourself out to that other place. But then it also can be positive reinforcement. Imagine yourself as like, uh, this is children, young people, so I apologise if it's in reference to adults, but it could be for adults. Imagine yourself as a superhero. What superpower do you have? What's unique to you? What's special about you? Um, but really happy to give more specific answers in email if you want more answers. Yeah, but look at mindfulness and look at positive themes as well. Hope that answers your question. Thanks, Tori. Um, yeah, can um, I just, just add one thing too, it's just, um, which was pointed out from Erin and, and the dance team before, is that, you know, take your time getting back into, into it. If you've been off for a while, then don't expect to be right up to performance or right back into a class as you've left perhaps three or four months ago. So don't be disappointed if it, if it doesn't happen and be encouraged to let people know take your time back into it and have some consideration for that as well, that people might be working themselves back, back into it. Some might have exercised a lot during lockdown and some might not have. So that's my consideration. Thanks, Chris, for that. Um, so there's another comment that's coming from Claire. Um, so she's saying there's a, there's a lot of information to take on board. Um, it's really good to get an update and there's some useful advice to think about. Um, is there anything to share about organisations getting ready to open the doors and staff? Uh, there's a lot of apprehension and opening around opening our doors again to members. Um, anybody like to contribute something on that? I think uh, the most important thing is, is to read the guidance and to also have uh, conversations, to start conversations with, with the staff so everybody knows um, that the risk assessment's been carried out and that the control measures have been put in place and people understand that uh, you've done everything you can to make it as safe as possible. So I think I would recommend um, having conversations uh, with, with the staff um, to get ready. Um, does anybody else from the panel want to add anything? I hope that uh, answers your question, Claire. We've still got a couple of more minutes left. Uh, if anyone else has a question or a comment, welcome to, to add them to the Q&A box. Uh, as Erin said, if um, after digesting all of this, thinking about it uh, overnight, you have questions tomorrow, uh, you can always contact us by email and uh, we're posting questions and the answers to the questions on our website. So uh, there's effectively a kind of knowledge base building up on our website alongside each of the webinars. Um, so do take a look um, at the questions and answers that we're posting there. Any final thoughts from anyone? Final questions? I was just about to say, just in terms of like, um, everyone feeling a bit apprehensive about going back, um, is that to always remember why you dance in the first place or why you teach dance in the first place and always go back to that. Cause I, I can totally understand with about going back and feel apprehensive when there's all these rules and guidelines. But I think always start with your passion and your love for dance. I just wanted to say that. Thanks Tori. That's a wonderful reminder for us all to think about why it is we dance in the first place and why we love it. So, um, I think that kind of brings us to a wrap. Please do send us any other questions or thoughts you have afterwards. And as Erin said, please do uh, consider joining the webinar tomorrow. There's a panel discussion and there's uh, an open space uh, opportunity as well. Um, 
So the details are there on the screen. And thanks once again to, uh, to our panel and to all of the presenters today. Thanks to Erin uh, for organising and thank you to our two lovely um, sign language interpreters too. We've been working very hard. <laughs> Lot, lots of words uh, to translate. Um, so I think that's it for today. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>